Hello, and good morning or good evening, wherever your day may be. I'd like to welcome you to today's Amazon Web Services webinar that invites you to learn how customers are saving money with AWS Cloud. My name is Sherry Sullivan. I'm with the partner marketing team here in Seattle, and I'll be your host today. I'd like to invite folks attending to submit questions anytime during today's webinar. We will make this presentation available post-event, and we'd like a friendly reminder that we are recording today's session. We've got an exciting topic for you today on how to save money in the cloud. It's top of mind for many customers, and I'm pleased today to have Chris Bleisner, he's the CEO, as well as Jeff Aiden, President and Co-Founder of Second Watch, one of our premier consulting partners with us today as well as Dan Rogers, who's head of our AWS product marketing here in Seattle. They'll share their expertise and demonstrate some real examples of how customers are saving by running their web apps on Amazon Web Services. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce you to Dan and to Chris. Take it away, Dan. Thanks, Sherry. So, um, yeah, uh, hi, welcome, everyone. Uh, so I want to start out by saying, um, Today's session is really designed to be very practical, so we're hoping that at the end of today, you'll walk away with some specific tools that you can take uh, into your work that will help you figure out how much you might save uh, in moving to AWS. So, you know, saving money is one of the top drivers for people considering the cloud, and uh, it raises a number of questions for people. I and mean, the questions typically are, okay, but exactly how much can I save? How, how do I get started? Where should I start? Where are the cost savings actually going to come from? Why is there such a big difference between on-premise and the cloud? And, and are there any kind of fundamental reasons uh, that are driving, fundamental factors that are driving that? So we're going to give you some general overview uh, first of, I guess, the economics of cloud. Um, maybe, maybe like you've heard it before, maybe, maybe hopefully you'll learn something new about what, what are some fundamental differences in the two models. But really, we're going to spend the bulk of the time on some very practical tools for thinking about, as I run my web application on on-premise versus in the cloud, how, how does that cost model change? So maybe let's start out by um, looking at uh, some real cost-saving examples. And I show these really uh, as much to show that you know, the cost savings are real. Uh, real companies have saved real money uh, with moving to AWS. And I'll give you some sense of how they've done so. So let's start with uh, Samsung. So Samsung, they decided uh, they wanted to run all of their smart hub applications with AWS. They use a, a variety of services, including compute, and database, and storage services. Um, this smart hub application basically supports all of their devices, TVs, Blu-ray devices, uh, tablets, phones, and the, the application authenticates these devices and then delivers content and pushes notifications uh, uh, across multiple devices. So Samsung uh, have estimated uh, they're, they've saved $34 million and reduced their costs by 85% in, in moving to AWS. This is another kind of quick example. Uh, this is a company called Global Blue. Uh, Global Blue uh, basically do value-added tax and service tax processing in 38 countries. Uh, they actually moved their BI reporting tool and, uh, and their corporate websites to AWS. In doing so, they were able to realize a million-dollar cost savings. And all these case studies and the specific details around them are actually available on the AWS website. But the next kind of example I wanted to kind of share with you uh, really shows a different part of cost savings. And this is the idea that um, uh, being able to start up quickly and uh, pay on an hourly basis actually encourages experimentation. So sometimes there's a cost of not doing things because of the legacy processes or uh, unavailability of on-premise infrastructure. And in this example, NASDAQ uh, you know, wanted to have the chance to uh, launch their market replay uh, service, which basically gives real-time quotes, um, uh, uh, sorry, a, a transactional history of, of, uh, of trades to any traders. So traders that want to see, did my, tra did my transactions trade on time? Uh, what was the average transaction time? What are past volumes of trades? And some analytics around that. So they basically launched this market replay system uh, uh, as, a, as a kind of beta test. And in the first month, uh, the costs around that market replay system were just $50. Uh, 
That's the kind of work that they wouldn't otherwise have been able to do in an on-premise infrastructure. Internally, I think they were quoted something like nine to 12 months to even be able to do this test of this new service. The service ended up being hugely popular and is available, available today. You know, on the kind of similar vein, um, this, is, this is kind of a, uh, the idea that, um, you know, with, with um, massive parallel infrastructure, you kind of get a choice in how you do jobs. So uh, in NASA's case, they wanted to process a bunch of images coming down from uh, uh, their spacecraft, and they needed to do uh, a massively parallel job and process hundreds of thousands of images in a short amount of time. So they got to trade off between let's do this across many servers uh, to allow us to do this quickly rather than over a long duration that they would have had to have done on-premise. And they were able to, uh, able to process those images really quickly uh, to allow them to beam the next, next set of instructions back to their, uh, back to their kind of um, uh, lander. So I guess the last couple of examples really kind of show that you know, there's, a, there's one dimension of thinking about costs, which is about how do I do exactly the same things I've always been doing a little bit cheaper. There's another dimension of costs as well, which is does this uh, new cost model allow me to do different types of work and different types of experimentation? Okay, so um, let me kind of, I'm actually going to switch this through here. And this basically says, you know, those examples I showed you are just some examples. Uh, there's, some, there's some great uh, other examples on the AWS website. Uh, IDC re recently, uh, we commissioned them to do a survey of 11 customers that had deployed AWS, and they found that on average they were saving 70% TCO over a five-year life cycle. Okay, so, how, so what are the fundamental reasons for this change in the, the economic model? Uh, so first I want to kind of talk you through, um, you know, the, the, I call it the traditional on-premise model. In the traditional on-premise model, what you see here, this is a web application. And on, uh, you know, on the vertical axis there, you see the number of um, users for this web application or the estimated traffic to a website. Okay? So you can think of this as like uh, predicting that our website is going to get 200,000 users. So in a, in a traditional uh, kind of on-premise infrastructure uh, where you have to plan for peak, essentially what you see in the bar charts here is the actual capacity uh, that they plan that they bought infrastructure for and in the line you see the actual demand for the application I'm going to walk this through left to right uh, to make this kind of clear what we're seeing here so in this first quarter uh, they had this web application and the company had imagined that they were going to get 200,000 visitors to that website so great so they get 200,000 visitors and you know they planned uh, quite well um, they planned uh, they actually ended up getting 180,000 visitors rather than the, the 200,000, so there was a little bit of wasted capacity. Unfortunately, in Q2, um, in, you know, they had the same amount of infrastructure. Um, the website proved to be a little bit more popular. And unfortunately, in Q2, they ended up losing some customers because they had really uh, bad performance issues because they didn't quite have the hardware to meet, to meet the need. So they decided that they weren't going to have that happen again uh, and kind of bought more infrastructure. And, you know, this company, in this theoretical example, it's pretty quick. They have a quarterly purchasing uh, cycle and an ability to deploy new servers on a quarterly basis. But unfortunately, Q3, um, you know, they planned for all this, you know, extra capacity, and, and it never turned up. So they had a bunch of wasted capacity. And what you kind of see as you go through this journey is on-premise, it's pretty hard to match your resources to the demand. Uh, Undershooting it uh, means wasted capacity. Overshooting it uh, means, uh, uh, sorry, overshooting in your capacity uh, means waste. Undershooting it means, you know, customer disappointment. The last, the last kind of bar chart here is the most dramatic. It basically says Q4, they planned big. Maybe they thought it was going to be a, a specific seasonal spike, uh, you know, maybe around the holiday period. Um, and that's great. Unfortunately, in Q1, when business is back to uh, you know, a typical Q1 uh, business, you see all of this wasted capacity. So this is really kind of um, uh, a general overview of what happens when you plan for peak on-premise. And it typically leads to uh, resource, alloc resource utilization in the 20 to 25 percent time uh, you know, um, range. And even with virtualization, uh, the fact of the matter is there are peaks and valleys in, in any given business that just uh, you cannot account for, uh, even with virtualization, evenings, uh, holiday periods, um, you know, spikes for a particular seasonal activity of your business. And what that ends up meaning is, in a traditional environment, you have wasted capacity. 
So how does that change? So with AWS, you're actually able to match the resources to, to your demand. And so how does, how does that work? Uh, essentially, um, you pay only as you, pay as you go. So there's no commitments, no long-term contracts required, and you replace all that upfront capital expense with low variable cost, only for what you use. So there is no need to pay upfront for any excess capacity like we just saw in the previous chart or get penalized for any underplanning. So think about compute resources. You pay on an hourly basis from the time you launch until the time you terminate. Uh, with things like elastic load balancing um, and auto scaling, you can automate the scaling up and scaling down of those resources. For things like data storage, uh, for data storage and transfer, you really only pay on a per gigabyte basis for what you use. Again, you're not having to plan this uh, massive amounts of storage for eventuality that you might need it in that given year. You, you can just pay for what you use. Um, if you need more, you scale it up. If you need less, you scale it down. So we charge really on just using the inf uh, underlying infrastructure that you consume. You can turn off those resources and stop paying when you don't need them. So that's kind of, uh, I guess, reason number one uh, of the fundamental difference in the economics is paying only for what you use instead of paying for peak. Reason number two um, is this idea of economies of scale. And so uh, AWS operates on uh, kind of how I think of it as, as more like a flywheel model. And basically means the more customers AWS gets, the more AWS usage increases. The more AWS usage increases, the more infrastructure we're able to procure and the investment that we can make in infrastructure optimization, which leads to economies of scale, which in turn leads to lower infrastructure costs, which in turn leads to reduced prices for customers, which in turn takes us back to, to more customers again. So that flywheel has been in effect since 2006 uh, and you know, when, when we first launched the service. And we've actually uh, reduced our prices 24 times since 2006. There aren't many, uh, I guess, you know, other enterprise IT companies that, that can say the same or have that same business model. And it's this idea that um, being part of AWS's infrastructure, um, you know, over time, you know, prices decrease and our, our, efficiency, our efficiencies increase. And it's pretty hard for companies on their own to achieve that same level uh, of eco economies of scale. They can't balance out all those peaks and troughs uh, from any one individual company. But across multiple uh, companies, uh, we're able to get much higher utilization uh, of, the, of our resources uh, relative to any other uh, on-premise organization. So that's a little bit of, uh, you know, I guess, uh, how we're able to offer those cost savings that we just saw that those other companies enjoyed. So I'm now going to uh, hand over to Chris Bleesner, um, uh from uh, Second Watch, and then we're going to go into a little bit more detail about Okay, let's get really specific now on how to calculate this cost savings and where this cost savings is going to come from. Great. Thanks, Dan. So I think the easiest way to do this is to actually pull up uh, uh, the TCO calculator that we've built. So we're going to go ahead and do that now. So I'm going to bring up uh, screen share. So just bear with me here for a second as this comes up. Okay, uh, so now you should be looking at the TCO comparison calculator for web applications. Uh, and Dan, I, I went ahead and loaded this with a sample application so that um, people could get a, an idea of how this tool works. And so uh, here, uh, this is a, a customer that we've been working with to help them understand uh, what the difference is between their on-prem costs and their costs in the cloud would look like. Uh, and so why don't we go ahead and walk through a scenario uh, and, and kind of talk through this idea. Okay, great. So, uh, yeah, I guess first of all, maybe we'll give a quick overview of this tool and what is this tool and, and how should it be used. Uh, the tool can be found on aws.amazon.com uh, slash economics. We built this tool really because uh, we were getting a lot of questions about, so how do I do good apples to apples comparisons? And we decided as we built the tool that it was not a marketing tool. We wanted uh, a customer to be able to input their exact settings of what they uh, either currently have on-premise or what they're planning on-premise to allow them to see a comparison uh, with, with AWS. And, uh, and, and in doing so, we kind of said it has to be highly customizable uh, so that the, so the settings here can match exactly uh, what a customer is trying to do. So broad strokes, there are kind of seven sliders 
So these seven sliders basically allow you to describe your on-premise infrastructure, your web servers, your database servers, your storage, telling, telling us a little bit uh, about your data centers, the anticipated growth rate that you might have, uh, the administrative cost of your data center, and your usage pattern. Um, just on the last one, on your usage pattern, on-premise, it doesn't actually matter what your usage pattern is because you have to plan for peak. With AWS, of course, our understanding that usage pattern allows us to better match the resources and switch those things off and on, uh, you know, depending on that usage pattern. So the simplest way to think of this tool is uh, in probably as little, as little as three minutes, you could move these seven simple sliders to describe your environment that you're either planning or that you have today and get a quick comparison of uh, versus AWS. Now, you know, we know that for many of our customers, that kind of quick, uh, quick analysis isn't sufficient and they want to go um, a heck of a lot deeper. So what we did here is in these kind of blue options here with the, these kind of drop downs is uh, if you wanted to describe your on-premise uh, uh, planned or existing uh, infrastructure in more detail to allow us to do a much more sophisticated comparison, you can do so. So in those drop downs, you basically see uh, we can really dial in um, all of your on-premise infrastructure, um, telling us a lot more detail about the specific servers that you have and the specific operating systems, telling us a lot more about the actual data center um, uh, you know, and what the setup is of that data center. So that's kind of a broad strokes of what the calculator is, why we did it, really supposed to be a customer tool uh, for you that should, should answer all those questions, uh, highly customizable. Um, uh, and, and then it gives you a nice uh, report at the end of exactly you know, what the cost savings might be and how those cost savings work. So that's kind of general overview. And then I think we're going to have uh, uh, Chris walk us through a specific customer and how they've used this tool and, uh, and some of the results that, that are associated with it. Great. Thanks, Dan. So in this particular case, uh, this particular usage case, uh, and again, remember this is focused on web applications. Uh, this customer had 10 web servers or web application servers. Uh, so we sort of bundle web and application servers in the same bucket here. And if we expand that drop, drop down that Dan talked about, um, you can actually see the, the details of those web and application servers. So here I can dial in um, the number of processors, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the number of cores, uh, processor speed, memory per server. Uh, you can see I've dialed those in uh, to be specific for this particular usage scenario. Um, how big my hard disk is uh, for that particular server, and then whether uh, they're Linux or Windows from an operating system perspective, uh, you also have the opportunity to dial in maintenance, uh, as, as that's a common thing that is overlooked when we're doing cost analysis. Uh, and then also, one of the things that we were keen about uh, early on with the TCO calculator was allowing folks to dial in to a specific cost. Uh, and so what you'll see across uh, the two server categories and the storage category are the ability to dial in a discount. So this is where I can actually um, help get the cost closer to what I'm actually paying. So maybe I'm getting a better discount than, than uh, somebody else or um, because I buy a certain type of uh, or, or brand, I'm getting a different price. So this really allows us to take that out of the equation and allow people to dial in to a particular price. And so here you, you've got an example of 10 web servers. They're, they're fairly basic, uh, loaded out here, ready to go. Uh, and they're Linux uh, as well. So I'm going to go ahead and, and close this for a second. Uh, then I'm going to describe my four database servers. So I'm going to scroll down here in a second and click on this drop-down, configure database servers. Hey, uh, uh, Chris, actually, before we move on, so, yep. so I'm seeing this number here at the bottom, this you know, 1410 per, per server. So you, I think you're basically saying uh, you, know, you can describe the exact cost that you have for your, for your hardware, and you're going to let the customer dial, dial it in with the discount slider so it, exactly. so it exactly matches. Yes. So this is the idea that, uh, you know, per the, you know, the statement I made earlier, that we, w we want to allow customers to really dial this in to the exact cost that they're seeing and not force some standard, standard industry costs that may or may not meet any particular customer. Exactly. What, what we found was customers were buying from different vendors, different manufacturers, uh, and, and also were getting different discount rates based on their size or, or other, other things. And so really this allows people to dial it in exactly as you said um, so that it can be much more closer to what they're actually paying. Got it. But, that, but, but on this hardware maintenance cost, I noticed that it doesn't go to zero. So you know, maybe tell me about why, why that doesn't go to zero. You bet. Uh, so a, a common thing that people uh, miss when they're talking about uh, maintenance costs around managing infrastructure is uh, the ability to carry those contracts. So it's typical for folks to buy that or have that included in the cost of the server. And, and those cover parts, uh, you know, whether it be hard drives going bad or, or memory or CPUs that need to be replaced. There are maintenance and, and uh, support contracts that are part of that. 
Uh, and so we want to make sure we're capturing that as a part of the cost so that we can account for that. Okay. So we're, we're in the database uh, service section, so very similar sliders and dials that you saw in the web application servers. Uh, it's, it's common, uh, we see from customers all the time that, that database servers are a little bit more loaded out. So here I've got uh, you know, a four-way box uh, with a little bit beefier um, CPU, a little more memory, uh, and then a terabyte of disk. So a lot of, a lot of hard disk uh, typically on the database servers. Um, same maintenance cost and then same discount. Uh, and then you can also pick the database platform here. So I'm showing uh, that you can pick, uh, in, in this particular case, the customer is using MySQL. So we go ahead and, and uh, pick MySQL in this particular box. And again, if we needed to, we could dial in to Dan's comment around the discount to get this per server cost to uh, as close to what we're paying as we can. So I'm going to go ahead and close this here for a second. Uh, the next bucket here that we're going to talk about is the, the storage footprint. So if I open up storage here for a minute, there's a couple of different categories of storage. And I think one of the interesting things that we find is that when you're, when you're dealing with on-premise infrastructure, um, there, there can be radical differences in the types of storage you buy. So whether it's direct attached server storage on a server or a network attached storage device or a SAN, um, there are lots of different um, costs associated with those and other equipment, labor, and other things. And so we wanted, we wanted to make sure that we were asking uh, folks what's, what, are, what are they using different, uh, different categories of storage for. And so in this particular case, uh, this customer didn't have any network attached storage, but they had a, a small five terabyte SAN. Um, they were using about six terabytes of, of backup storage. Um, that could be disk-based or tape-based. Um, then they have a, a long-term archive storage as well, which is typically tape-based uh, and stored off-site, and that in this case was four terabytes. Uh, again, we have, we have hardware software maintenance around those things. Um, and then uh, a discount slider. And I, I ratcheted up the discount slider here a little bit more um, to deal with the fact that we're seeing customers uh, get much larger discounts um, from storage vendors. And in fact, uh, the, the default on the tool is 50% is uh, in this particular customer's use case scenario. Um, their discount that they were receiving from their storage manufacturer was about 25% off of rack rates. Hey, uh, Chris, I know you said um, how much storage they're using, but it's really how much storage they've bought yeah. uh, that's kind of the, the key thing, right? Um, right. If, even if the web application was only using 50% uh, of what they bought, uh, the fact they bought it, there's a real cost associated with the, the unutilized uh, resource there, right? No, very true, Dan, and, and I'm glad you brought that up. One of the things that we talk about is sort of the pay-for-use differences of, of the model of AWS versus on-prem, and storage is a great place to take advantage of that. I'll go ahead and collapse this here for a second. The next thing we get asked about is the actual physical data center or um, server room that, that uh, things are housed in. And for web applications, uh, it's very common um, to do co-location. So I picked a, a co-location center here. Um, and then I can determine what level of power redundancy um, I have. In this particular case, I'm using sort of a tier one data center that gives me uh, dual utility providers. Um, so I've got backup power there that's provided. Um, I've got full network redundancy, so I've got redundancy in my switches and my routers and my load balancers, uh, and, and that's obviously done to maintain uptime and, and resiliency. Um, what I, another key point around this, this for folks moving into Amazon Web Services is that a lot of these things are provided by default and factored into the rates for EC2 or other services, and so th those aren't things that have to be paid for, um, and, and those are covered within AWS as well. Um, I've ratcheted up the bandwidth here to uh, 50 megabits per second. Uh, I, we use, always use uh, backup telecommunications providers, so multiple providers. Um, if you're running a website, it's keen that uh, you're using multiple providers um, because that way if you have an outage on one provider, you know, your customers can still reach you. Uh, and AWS uh, buys bandwidth from multiple providers today, so you sort of get that again out of the box um, and nothing you have to do or pay extra for. Um, here again, I've got the hardware and software maintenance around my network gear and my data center. Uh, and then the last slider here uh, is, allows folks um, to dial in the depreciation schedule for their equipment. So um, here I'm going to leave this default at, at three years, as, as was the example for this customer. Um, but you can dial this up to seven years uh, if you need to, if you depreciate your, your equipment on a, a larger schedule. So yeah, well, why does that matter? What, what, why does your depreciation schedule matter? You bought the server, the costs are real. What, what's, what's the depreciation schedule got to do with this TCO comparison? So part of what we wanted to break out in the TCO calculator was the ability for customers to see what the capital upfront expense was. So what did I have to write a check for? And then also how it was hitting my operating expense budget. So when I buy servers upfront, typically businesses depreciate those over a useful life. And so that may be three years, it may be five years or seven years. And so that's how that actually hits your operating expense budget um, is that depreciation cost. 
or depreciation expense um, every year. And so we wanted to be able to dial that in, and you have to know how, how long of a period of time you're going to spread out the cost. And so we do that for you to, to, to do an apples to apples. I'm going to go ahead and close that down. Uh, and then the last three areas that I can tweak here really don't have any detailed sliders around them, but are allow you to dial in a couple of sort of macro level things here. One is growth rate. Uh, Dan talked a little bit about this. And one of the challenges we had was understanding, well, how do we define business growth rate? Because a lot of companies do different things. And we decided, let's just have this be techni technology infrastructure growth rate. So how often are you adding things to your infrastructure, whether it be storage, um, increased storage, increased servers, footprint, um, bandwidth, whatever those things are, you can dial those things in. So you can set that to zero uh, if you don't really have any growth, um, or you can dial that in if you have a much faster growth rate. In this particular case, the customer was experiencing about an 8% um, IT uh, infrastructure growth rate per year. Uh, and then we have an administrative uh, section here. And, and one of the things we wanted to allow customers to dial in was how heavy of an admin burden was their existing web application. So uh, we worked with lots of customers where it's very light, and so it could be in that 10 to 15 range. Um, and then there's lots of customers uh, that we worked with that um, because of legacy systems or, or other things, their administrative burden is a lot bigger. And so we wanted to also factor that into the costs around how to compare between the two. Uh, and so in this particular customer's case, we, we chose 15%. And, then, and I've heard this rule of thumb that uh, it's something like, you know, for typical on-premise, that, that a good rule of thumb is uh, 50 servers per admin. You know, how would that, you know, how would I think about that number here? Yeah, so um, that's factored into the default. So if you, you stick with the default on, or around the 15, we've got that covered. If it's more than that, um, then you can slide the slider up, or if it's less than that, you can slide it down. Okay. Um, and then lastly, we've got usage pattern. And as Dan mentioned, this isn't something that necessarily is relevant uh, on-prem, but it, it's definitely relevant on the AWS side. And so this allows us to take advantage of, of varying usage patterns and be able to cost those differently. Uh, so we've got three different examples here you can choose from. Um, spiky predictable is sort of the cyclical um, ups and downs, and I, I know where that, know where my usage peaks and, and valleys are. Um, the uncertain, unpredictable model is really, um, I have no idea where things are going, but it's going to jump all over the place. Uh, and then we also have a steady state. So if you sort of just have a, a, a normal level of traffic and it doesn't really change a whole lot with your web application, um, you, you know, that's probably the most uncommon that I've seen from a web application perspective, but we definitely have the, the use case there, so you could pick that if you needed to. Uh, and in this particular customer's scenario, um, they had a very cyclical schedule, so they knew, uh, and so we chose spi Spiky Predictable here to document that they knew exactly where their peaks and valleys were. So maybe, maybe we kind of before we kind of get the results of this, we'll just kind of recap why we just did this exercise and what, what we were doing. So essentially, um, you know, think of this tool as a, a way to guide the, com uh, guide the conversation. The tool really is a way of thinking about all of the cost buckets that go into running a web application. These are what we think are the major cost buckets in running a web application. And the thing that Chris did here was uh, he literally described an actual customer's on-premise costs or cost buckets associated with running that, that web application. This is a real customer. This is their actual settings. Uh, there were no other major costs in running that web application. But what this kind of, I guess, tools allowed, allowed us to do is think through all the buckets of those costs. Uh, it's not just the servers. It turns out it's not even just the servers and the bandwidth. It is also a bunch of things like administrative costs, maintenance costs. You have to think about the uh, spikiness or the traffic of the actual, uh, you know, the workload. So, you know, the, the tool is really a way to kind of make sure that you think about all of those costs that go into running that web application so you can do good apples-to-apples -apples comparisons. Great. And we'll cover some more in detail here in a couple other slides around uh, how to think about each particular bucket. So here I'm going to click on the Compare TCO just for a second to show you what the summary screen looks like. And here I'm able to see what my on-premise costs uh, on a yearly basis are and what my AWS costs are based on the calculations that we ran. Um, so you can see a couple of, of interesting things here. Obviously, uh, Dan, it's a lot less than um, what it is on-prem, and, and you talked a lot about that early on, about the difference in, in the cost model. Um, you know, there's definitely some, some things that are included. Like I, I don't have to pay data center fees um, when I run an AWS. Um, there's no co-location fees. There's no fees for me to pay there. And so from an environment perspective, those fees sort of go away, um, which I think is, is pretty interesting. Um, and then there's another component here. There's a, there's a, a detailed report. Um, I won't click on that button today. We won't go through that. But if we clicked on the download full report button on the right here, um, you'll actually get a, a very detailed PDF output of your session, your variables, what you chose. Um, and so we create these on the fly and allow you to save them and, and print them off so you have a takeaway. Um, to, to basically start the conversation. And we also share with you the calculations and the assumptions we used 
so that you can really dive deep into your details and figure out, okay, how does this map to my cost and my organization and, and then where we're going with that. Yeah, um, I'll just add one one kind of other interesting data, uh, data point. At uh, the reInvent conference, I recently uh, went through this tool um, pretty much real time with, with, a, with a customer, Thomson Reuters, and uh, they were really surprised that, uh, you know, we got this into, uh, I think, within about uh, $20 of the exact cost savings that they'd uh, predicted to their CFO uh, based on the current contracts they had around, you know, hardware, hardware purchasing and how that compared to when they switched over to AWS. So uh, whilst the tool is really supposed to uh, engender that kind of thought exercise thinking through those cost buckets, we think we can get it uh, pretty accurate to the, uh, the actual cost savings you might experience. Great. So I want to talk just a little bit, uh, shift gears here for just a second before we get into the details and talk a little bit about um, Second Watch, our experience, and, and why, why we were chosen to, to help build out the TCO calculator. So um, Second Watch is one of the largest AWS um, system integrators today. We're a premier consulting partner, so we appreciate the partnership that we've had with Amazon Web Services. And we really help companies think through how to, how to leverage the cloud and how is it different from their existing on-prem environment. And so we help from the strategy and roadmap perspective, so we do a lot of cost analysis, we do a lot of ROI or TCO uh, analysis, um, and then we can help understand what applications can be moved and, and which ones uh, are maybe aren't appropriate or, or need some refactoring. We do a lot of cloud architecture work, um, builds and migrations, and then support services as well. So we're sort of this um, full, full meal deal for getting you into the cloud and supporting you once you're there. Um, so with that, uh, I want to shift back to sort of um, things that, that you need to be aware of in terms of of why you, would, why you would pick the cloud for web applications. Well, one of the things that we talked about early on, Dan, was that you know, one of the reasons why web applications run really well on AWS is that most of them have varied usage and demand. Um, they're able to uh, scale up and scale down, and, and Amazon handles that really nicely. Um, we obviously know website, web tra website traffic can also sp spike unpredictably. So um, it's, it's, I think a lot of folks uh, look for that day when they'll get 10,000 orders or 100,000 orders and they look for that. Um, but I know in the back room the IT guy is sweating because he's like, do I have enough infrastructure to be able to handle the 10,000 orders that are going to come when we release a, reduce a, or produce a coupon or, or some other thing that, that drives it. Uh, and so you know, that, that's another problem that can be handled on AWS very nicely. Um, there are limits to physical hardware. So as Dan talked about, you, sort of, you, you build this for your peaks but maybe you, you misinterpreted the peak, and so you um, have a bad experience one quarter because, in, in Dan's example, you went over what your capacity was, and so then you had to go back and buy more capacity. And so there are definitely limits to the, the physical hardware side. Um, and then also just quickly how, how quickly you can deploy and, and manage that stuff. Um, obviously, the overutilization can cause a poor customer experience, and there, there are a lot of large websites that, that use Amazon Web Services today, and so that's another reason why we, we chose to start with web applications. So diving in a little bit deeper, um, and I want to touch on each particular bucket. So here is the, the server bucket in, in particular. I think one of the things that we find with customers is that they don't always compare um, the sort of pay-as-you-go model very well with the on-premise model. The on-premise model is a long-term model. You're buying equipment, you're buying hardware, and it's typically got anywhere from three-year on the low end to a five, seven, or maybe even a ten-year useful life. And so customers are buying that for the long term. Um, and they need to actually compare that with AWS for the long term. And so um, make sure you're thinking about a three to five year time frame on AWS. Um, that means you're going to use uh, heavy reserved instances for your base workload, um, and you're going to use three year reserved instances for that. So that gets you the lowest possible pricing on the platform. Maybe it's worth just describing these reserved instances a little bit at this point. So yeah, there's really two kind of two two models for you know how you pay for how you pay for AWS. The instances are the same in both examples. So we kind of talked about the on-demand instances, this kind of idea of pay-as-you-go. But also, there's another option, which is where you pay less when you reserve capacity. So for certain products, you can invest in reserving that capacity. So you pay a low upfront fee, and you get a significantly discounted hourly rate overall. So I guess for the, you know, those pieces of the workload over that three to five year time period that you know are going to be fairly stable, or at least you know about uh, how much capacity you might need, now, if you're able to reserve that capacity, you can get a saving on that on the on-demand hourly rate, and those savings can be like 42 to 71 percent. So one of the kind of keys for apples to apples comparisons is if you are doing something beyond, say, a one-month time period comparison, uh, then you know using uh, utilizing reserved instances as part of your AWS infrastructure is critical. Uh, most 
uh, you know, of the of the web apps customers we have, you know, are employing reserved instances as part of that strategy. And again, it really is just a buying vehicle for those instances. The actual underlying infrastructure is the same. Um, it's just a way to say, yeah, I'm willing to kind of say that I want to reserve some of that capacity ahead of time. In exchange, we get better ability to manage our capacity, and we can trade that for a, a much lower long-term price uh, for the customer. Great. So that's that's a little bit about reserved instances. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, the other gotcha on the service side that we always see is that folks uh, forget to include their, their virtualization maintenance costs. So um, when you buy virtualization licenses, whether it be from Microsoft, VMware, or other folks, um, you have an ongoing maintenance and support contract with those folks. Um, that's real dollars that you're spending every year for those costs. Um, those, the virtualization costs are baked into the EC2 rates, so there's no additional contract you're paying for uh, maintenance costs or support for your virtualization infrastructure on AWS. So uh, shifting into storage for a second, um, one of the things that we found, and, and there's links in the resources bucket uh, in the PDF that gets generated out of the, the TCO web applications tool, um, is that utilization on storage is really above 60%, and in a lot of cases it's, it's quite a bit below that. And Dan, you talked about that a little bit when we were walking through the demo. I think what's interesting for customers to understand here is that um, people buy for peak capacity, and when, when we're buying large SANs or, or large network storage devices, these are expensive uh, pieces of equipment, and I'm typically not using the whole thing, and so I typically buy it for a five-year, uh, what I think I'm going to use in five years, and year one, I may only be using 10% of it. And then year two, maybe I add another 10%, and so as I go, I add as I go. The nice thing about AWS is you're only paying for what you use. Um, you know, the other interesting thing about storage um, to compare uh, around the different services that Amazon Web Services offers is that there are different tiers and different charges for those tiers. And so um, when I buy S Amazon S3 simple storage service um, storage, I've got three copies of, those, of that data. And so I need to make sure that I'm comparing that to my on-prem cost. So is my on-prem, do I have one, just one SAN and I'm not replicating that anywhere, or am I actually replic replicating that data to another data center or to two other data centers, in this particular case, to be an Apple's Apple's S3? Um, so there's a lot of interesting points that we want to make sure that people are capturing. Uh, on the network side, uh, you know, one of the things that's interesting about this difference in the, in the model from a cost perspective, so I've been on the buy side of IT for a long time, and, and when you buy bandwidth, typically it's, it's a fixed uh, fee bandwidth uh, piece for capacity, and there's a lot of waste in that model because um, you never know one day to the next from a web application what your traffic is, or maybe you sort of have a sense because it's cyclical, um, but there, there are almost always peaks and valleys there. And so because I'm, because I'm never paying in the physical world for what I use, um, there's typically a, quite a bit of waste there. Uh, on Amazon, I just, get, I just pay for the data transfer. And so I actually have to do the math and figure out, okay, how much data am I transferring? But I'm only paying for what I'm using. And so if I have a low one month and, I, and then, and then I, I peak up the next month, the, the, one, the month I had a low, I'm actually paying quite a bit less. Um, you also have to factor in sort of the admin costs and the hardware costs around your network. Um, and, and then the redundancy. And so we talked a little bit about that as we were walking through the tool. Um, AWS has built-in redundancy on the telecommunications provider side of things, um, as an end user and an end buyer of my own physical equipment, I have to, I have to pay for those links. I have to buy a, a backup tele telecommunications link and, and pay for that, whether I'm using it or not. Uh, and so that's, that's also a key driver here. On the environment side, uh, this is stuff we love to talk about. Um, there, there is no environment charges on the AWS side. I don't pay for data center fees. Um, but this is where there's a lot of hidden fees that folks have a, sometimes have a hard time um, getting their brain around wh where the costs are coming from. And so make sure when you're calculating your costs, you're including uh, rent or, um, or depreciation expense on a building, if it's, it's included in a building that you own, um, the power, the cooling, um, all those kinds of things. Um, and then also, um, when, I, when I'm paying for a data center, when I'm outsourcing this thing, um, you know, it's, it's sometimes a challenge for me to leverage the entire thing that I'm buying. And so when I buy a rack from a, a data center provider, am I allowed to fill it up without paying power overages? And one of the things we see all the time from customers who are in a co-location environment is they're paying overages for either bandwidth or power utilization, uh, and so it's very frustrating for the end consumer that they, they bought a contract and then they're paying, paying overages just to use the, the equipment that they've purchased. And then lastly, uh, around administration, um, we, we caution folks to think about the labor involved, um, how things are different on the model. I mean, Dan, you talked about um, sort of the average being maybe a 50 to 1 server to admin ratio uh, on premises, uh, we see sort of a 4x improvement in that when we go to Am Amazon Web Services. And so we can get up to a 200, 
uh, to one server to admin ratio. And one of the reasons why we can get there, um, in addition to other sort of reduced administration costs, is that uh, everything within AWS is built around web services and automation. And so there's a lot of neat things you can do on the platform that are difficult, uh, if not impossible, to do uh, on the on-premises world. So a lot of opportunity to, to save on labor costs and, and automate things. So to sort of kind of wrap this up a little bit, um, I want to talk a little bit about some things to leave you with. Um, when you're calculating your, your TCO, um, make sure you're planning for, for the cloud or AWS the same way you would do for your physical environment. So if you need dual data centers or if you need geographically uh, separate data centers that you plan for that, if you need backup telecommunication providers, you plan for that. Um, make sure that it's an apples to apples. That's probably the, the best way to talk about that stuff. Use the three-year uh, reserved instance pricing that Dan talked about. It's a great way to save money. Um, yes, there is some upfront expense there, but um, much less than you would incur um, buying equipment and also uh, allows you to get really, really reduced rates. Um, there's a discount for actual usage here. So um, when you talk about what you bought from a storage perspective, go in and take a look at what you're actually using um, so that people have a good sense of Oh, okay, am I using half of my storage that I've, I've provisioned? Um, make sure you're including everything. Uh, so we've tried to break it out in categories here to make it easier for you to look at the PDF and look at the results and, and make sure you're including all the, all the pieces. Uh, and then also involve your finance folks. So if you're part of a larger organization and you have financial analysts that can help you do this, um, those guys are great about uh, being able to pull numbers and be able to, to help you understand where the costs are coming from and, and how they're working. Uh, and they, they love to go through this sort of activity. Uh, we have several resources available. Um, obviously, the, the calculator itself is on aws.amazon.com slash economics. Um, there's also a, a link um, to the, the white paper there, uh, and then you can also get details of, of Second Watch's uh, expertise around the, the TCO calculator as well. Um, so we're happy to help you out there as well. So I wanted to turn this back over to Sherry uh, and say thanks again for the webinar today. Well, Chris and Dan, thank you uh, very much. And uh, to folks who have joined kind of midstream in this webinar, we invite you to um, ask questions. We do have some teed up already, so um, we'll take some time for Q&A as time allows here. Um, so I'm going to point this first question um, back to you, Dan. Um, a question from Jeffrey is, um, will AWS expand to other Unix platforms? Um, yeah, I'm not, I, I think uh, I'm gonna. I'm, I think I'm not. I'm gonna punt on the product futures and product roadmap questions uh, for now. I think this probably isn't the, the best forum to kind of talk about future roadmap. Okay. Thanks. All right. Great. So we have a question from Roger, and I'll point this back to you, Chris. Um, Roger has a terabyte of uh, in his database today, and his question is: um, Do I need to pay to upload that, or is it the fee to upload? to the database the same as kind of a normal data access. Does that make sense? Yeah, so the, the network bandwidth and, and, and data transfer rates are definitely different on AWS versus the on-prem model. And so one of the things we see customers trying to figure out is how do I calculate how much data is going to get uploaded and how much I use um, based on my actual data usage size. Um, upload right now into the, the system is free. Download is based on how much data you're moving. And so it really depends on is it a one-time upload of a terabyte of data or is it incremental over a month or a year? Uh, and so part of that is diving into the details and understanding, okay, is it upload that's going to change or once I've got it in there? Um, and there are, are lots of ways to do that. So you can do that uh, over the over the Internet or you can also, um, Amazon has an import-export service you can leverage to, to move large data sets into the platform as well a little bit uh, easier than, than just transferring it over the wire. Okay, great. So this is another question uh, specific to, as you were going through the TCO calculator tool, Gabriel asked, is bandwidth cost not considered? So bandwidth cost is considered, uh, and so it's definitely a part of the tool, and if you pull down the PDF, you'll understand how we're calculating that. In the TCO calculator, we actually ask you for how much bandwidth you're using, uh, and so we ask you to specify not only how much bandwidth you're using, but also how many telecommunications providers you're using, uh, because you might mm -hmm. buy... Uh, in, in our particular example, they were using 50 megabits per second uh, of bandwidth from one vendor, but then you have a backup vendor as well. Uh, and so we, we definitely account for that. Uh, and there's a section in the FAQ that talks about how we calculate those savings. Okay, great. So another question um, specific to the, the tool itself is, um, 
a question from Roger is, do you provide a built-in performance and uptime monitoring tools? So the, the TCO calculator is, is really meant to ask the question or answer the question of what, what are the cost savings involved from going from an on-prem environment into uh, the Amazon Web Services environment. Um, there are lots of opportunities, and we worked with, with lots of customers. We've done over 200 projects on the platform this last year. Um, I can tell you that customers use a, a varied uh, amount of management tools and monitoring tools, whether they're built-in monitoring tools like CloudWatch on, on Amazon Web Services side, or they're using System Center or other um, platform tools and technologies to manage their infrastructure. Um, really, it's a client-by-client -client basis. Uh, you, can, you can choose to use whatever tools you, you would like, typically. Uh, and we do a lot of work to help customers integrate their environments into the platform. So yeah, and I'll just kind of add to that. I think the question is, if, uh, is asking, uh, you know, does AWS have any inbuilt monitoring tools? Mm -hmm. The answer is CloudWatch. Uh, so that's monitoring for the uh, those cloud resources. Um, so you know, you, the system admins can be able to collect and track all the metrics that they need and gain insight and react immediately um, to keep their applications businesses running smoothly. The other thing I'd talk about is Trusted Advisor. Uh, one of the um, uh, products that we have as part of our support uh, package is, is uh, allows you to do proactive, um, you know, uh, have a proactive look at your resources, figure out where any of the bottlenecks might possibly be in the future, and plan around that. So those are kind of two products that I have folks look at is CloudWatch and Trusted Advisor. Great. Thank you. So um, we have another question from, um, this is specific to kind of the performance of the tool um, from Asif. Is, um, his question is, around the CPU and memory scaling. Um, is there a tool that automates the CPU and memory scaling based on variables defined by the user, or if there's a threshold kind of monitoring um, that enables that functionality? So today, uh, the way that we scale typically, especially with web applications, is, is allowing horizontal scaling. And so being able to add more atomic machines to the pool, whether it be a web application or a database application. And so we encourage a lot of folks to be able to do it that way. Um, and you use a, a, a functionality called auto scaling within Amazon Web Services to be able to do that. Uh, and allows you to do a couple different things. It allows you to schedule uh, schedule the scaling. Uh, if you have, happen to know your schedule or you want to have more control around when those events happen. Uh, and it also allows you to base it uh, the, the scaling based on performance benchmarks. So you could definitely, uh, in this particular case, um, look at CPU usage, look at memory usage, and scale based on that. Um, so we definitely have the ability to, to do that with the platform as well. Okay. Yeah, and in, in combination with load balancing, elastic load balancing, and elastic cache, the, the combination of those services really allows that environment to kind of be pretty scalable. Okay, great. Um, so this is a, a, a similar vein question here um, from Chad. Is um, how are the hourly costs calculated? Um, is it based on an hour use of a CPU or a CPU used during that hour? So can you maybe speak to the functionality of the tool? Sure. So the way Amazon Web Services bills today, and we, we have a, a cost allocation tool, so we, we spend a lot of time in billing and, and cost allocation, uh, is if you use an instance of EC2 for a particular hour or any time within that hour, you're going to get billed for that hour. Um, and as Dan talked about, there's lots of ways to take advantage of pricing schemas around that. Um, you know, there's reserved instances. There's actually a spot market um, if you can buy, uh, you know, excess capacity that way. So there's lots of ways to sort of um, enable your business to save money on the platform. Uh, but it's based on the instance hours, basically, is the way to think about it. Okay. All right. Great. So we have time for a, a couple more questions here. Um, let me uh, point this back to um, to you, Chris. Um, you know, if, if this is from Kevin, um, we're trying to decide um, on an RDS or installing a DBMS from the ground up on an EC2. Um, what features of RDS kind of justify that hourly cost? Well, one of the things I, I love about RDS, and RDS sort of blurs the line between infrastructure as a service and platform as a service, so it sort of brings you up a stack a little bit, is that RDS, uh, Amazon Web Services, takes care of a lot of the routine maintenance, um, backups, uh, upgrades, uh, patching, those kinds of things, and allows me to focus in on my business and just running my business. So if I don't have DBAs on staff or, or if they're expensive resources for me to use, RDS can be a great way for me to not have to uh, manage those platforms. And in the case of MySQL, there's, a, there's an added benefit 
uh, as well in terms of having um, multi-AZ setups and, and read replicas and things where um, I can actually do very complicated and sophisticated database infrastructure without having to manage that. And so there's real cost savings around the labor, and typically those things require a database administrator or a very expensive headcount to manage um, when you're talking about sort of um, you know, multi-data center data replication and redundancy, those things are expensive and complicated to manage, um, and RDS handles that for me uh, with certain platforms. So that's one of the things we liked about it. Yeah, so I'll kind of add to that. You can hit the patching piece, and there's also the automated backups associated with, with RDS. And then there's a, in addition, there's this uh, provision IOPS service around RDS, and that's a way uh, really to get consistent I.O. performance uh, from your storage. So provision IOPS really is um, a, a good way to deliver fast, predictable I.O. Uh, you can provision up to 10,000 IOPS for, for any new database instance. So uh, I think in terms of giving you consistency around your database performance, RDS is uh, going to give you a great option. Um, and it, you know, really you just set the performance that you want and, and have the resources uh, automatically scale up and scale down to meet that specific performance. So I think uh, you know if you have have a specific application where consistency of, uh, of database is important, RDS will be you know an interesting option. Great, thank you for clarifying. I know you've given a very detailed overview of the the calculator. Um, we have another question from Andre in terms of. Um, it's kind of a two-part question, but how volatile are kind of spot incident instances versus on-demand, and is Amazon um, doing anything kind of to smooth out those potential spike price spikes, or is it kind of market and supply demand? Do you want to take this one, or you want me to? No, you, you start. And sure. Yeah. So, uh, spot instances. Um, are based on, on a, a bidding system or an auction system where I specify a price I'm willing to pay for that instance, and as long as the spot price is, is underneath that price or, or close to that price, I will get that instance as long as that price is in effect. When the spot price changes and it goes above my bid, um, then I lose that instance. And so the volatility there, um, your application needs to be able to handle that. Um, and so as long as it can handle losing an instance at any given time, um, you can take advantage of the, the spot instance. Um, I I believe, uh, given our experience working with AWS, that's, that's a mechanism they use to sell excess capacity, and they talk quite a bit about that. So I, I don't think that particular piece is going away, um, the volatility piece, because I think that's part of how they, they sell the excess capacity. Yeah, and the, you know, there's actually an area of our website that's around architecture and application to use Spot. So you can uh, you know, effectively minimize that vo volatility so that uh, in, the, in the event that the price has risen above your Spot price, you will move on to uh, you know potentially on-demand priced EC2. So, if, so you you are able to kind of uh, mix and match between the uh, advantages of, of spot and then uh, moving to on-demand if you if you need that, that specific instance to, to continue running. So um, that's definitely a way of architecting the the application. Great. I'm going to um, paraphrase this next question. Um, it's it's really how do you justify moving to AWS when on-prem you know, you have staff in place, you've already committed to your physical hardware, and, you know, how do you sort of justify this to your management, and maybe you can um, share some insights in terms of how, how the tool's a great way to, to have a proof point, but mm -hmm. what's your recommendation? I think, you know, we've worked with lots of customers on uh, hundreds, uh, closing on thousands uh, of customer cost comparisons and, and allocations. I, from our perspective, I think what we see a lot are folks looking at equipment upgrades, maintenance contract renewals, um, decision points in their life cycle around spending more dollars on a broken cost model. And so from our perspective, what we typically look for is there's always an inflection point that comes around renewing a data center contract, re, you know, buying new gear, um, doing those kinds of things. And, and we do see a lot of customers that are like, hey, we just bought servers and, and infrastructure, now what do we do? Uh, in some cases, um, there are used markets for that gear or other ways to sort of get out of the uh, uh, of that purchase, or you, you choose to depreciate and just move things over time, uh, and hopefully it wasn't a, a full data center refresh, and maybe it's just one application that got the new hardware. But I think from our perspective, um, they're really driven around that decision-making process around, okay, I, I'm, I'm now looking at buying new hardware. What do I do? Um, should I look at the cloud? How do I compare? And so that's one of the reasons why we built the tool is to help people do that comparison and understand what the cost differences are, and then that will help justify with management, hey, what should we do with our existing gear? Um, because in typical scenarios, there's always existing footprint. 
do we sell it? Do we, um, do we just um, downgrade it to maybe development and test environments um, and non-production gear? There's, there's lots of scenarios that can be done there to sort of, because um, I think what, hopefully what we've, we've gotten through today is that there's lots of cost savings to be had on the platform, um, and it can make a very attractive picture for management. Um, as long as you have a conversation around that, um, that can sometimes spur other activities like, hey, great, maybe we can push this stuff down to dev and test and, and, and look at our production Amazon or other things. So Yeah, I'd, I'd kind of add a few more scenarios. So I think the hardware refresh one is kind of really uh, obvious and easy one. I think there's another couple as well, I'd say, uh, performance, uh, you know, where there's a specific performance uh, issue around the application as it's running today. That engenders a conversation around are we giving our customers the best service that we need, which then engenders a do we have the right IT uh, infrastructure to support our customers. Uh, then I would also kind of say um, other projects that, that are in the IT pipeline that you might want to do if only you had the resources or the people uh, to do that. So when you look at the administration, the maintenance associated with some of those, the traditional on-premise applications, um, what would happen if they were able to be repurposed for that new thing that we're now not able to do for another year? And so I think to, looking at that holistic set of IT projects and realizing that there's that ability to kind of shift resources around, um, you know, if you're not having uh, other people, you know, maintaining uh, and administering that web application would be another kind of um, a good uh, way to kind of justify that internally. Great. Um, a a follow-on question here um, from Chad is, um, for a web app, scaling up or down to a larger or smaller machine, is it an easy process? Is there an AMI that comes into play? Yeah, so we, we prefer web apps to actually scale horizontally versus vertically um, for lots of reasons because it allows us to have more control around uh, cost and also the ability to scale out in, in large quantities. Um, there's always going to be limits to how big of an instance you can scale up to, um, but in, in the AWS platform anyway, we typically think about horizontal scaling being unlimited. So if I do need to, to scale out to hundreds of machines, I can do that. Um, the, the process is pretty straightforward. Auto scaling is documented really well. There are APIs to call, um, command line utilities to use. We work with a lot of customers to implement auto scaling. Um, you can also start and stop a server really quickly. We do this all the time uh, internally for our development environments. Um, when we need a bigger box for a machine install or um, heavy data load, whatever the, the use case might be, um, typically sizing a new machine typically takes less than 60 seconds to do on the platform, and it's something that helps us manage costs and, and, and also get the great performance that we need. Terrific. Well, I appreciate uh, your time today, uh, both Chris and Dan, um, great job providing an overview of how customers can save money on AWS. I'd like to thank all of you who attended today's um, session, and if you have questions, we've put a slide up. Uh, feel free to contact Chris or AWS, and we'll catch up with your other questions that we didn't get to. So thank you again for your time today, and this concludes today's webinar.